Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Stagger Cast. We appreciate you tuning in. In this episode, Greg sits down with Adrian Geyer. Adrian hails from the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont and is the owner and operator of Ridgeline Athlete, a company that is focused on helping hunters get in better shape, both physically and mentally, so they can make the most of the hunting seasons when they come around. Adrian specializes in these programs to be possible for anyone who wants to get in mountain shape from the ease of their own home. From courses focused on certain muscle groups and mechanics to broad cardio programs, there's a solution out there for you. If you want to learn more about these programs, we'll post links to Ridgeline Athlete below. For listeners who want to put their best foot forward this upcoming season, you can get signed up for these courses at a discount by using the code STAGGERCAST23, all one word, at checkout for 20% off. Aside from helping Big Woods hunters get their ass in shape, Adrian is a highly successful and skilled buck tracker with many great stories of big rack bucks with big old feet hitting the dirt season after season. Without further ado, we'll dive right in. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we appreciate you tuning in. You're listening to Stagger Cast, brought to you by Stagger Gear. All right, everything looks good. Welcome to another episode of Stagger Cast. No Adam tonight. He's, uh, I know why he's not here. I'm sitting here with my buddy Adrian Geyer, uh, owner of Ridgeline Athlete. Um, Hunter and fitness extraordinaire, and I think Adam's intimidated. You want to know why? Is that the case? Yeah, I mean, he's here. We are <laughs> two peak athletes sitting here, and I think he didn't really feel comfortable being in our presence. So, well, I he's I, hiding, he's running, he's down in Aruba. You said, <laughs> yes, he's he hiding is. on the beach. <laughs> he is, yeah. <laughs> so I don't think it's that, but uh, anyways, yeah. <laughs> so I give him a little crap, but Adam's but yeah. missing out. He's missing out big time. We're going to have to do this again because he's got a million questions for you. He's a, he's a real, you know, he's in the gym every single day and he's, uh, he really keeps after it and he's kept me That's after great. it. So, um, yeah. but yeah, so Adrian Geyer, I'm up in Linden, Vermont tonight. Um, only one town of, uh, away from my hometown of Danville, but, um, why don't you tell everybody? Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's I live right cool. in Danville. So, right uh, so why don't you tell everybody who you are, what you do and kind of a little background on yourself and then we'll <laughs> go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So born and raised here in the NEK. Um, I, um, I've been a, you know, outdoorsman, grew up, uh, son of a logger. Uh, my father's, he's in his early seventies now and, and still, still cutting trees, hand cutter. Yep. Um, and we were exposed to the great outdoors and, and, and woodsmanship very early on. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm super thankful for that, uh, because that, you know, just really helped, uh, shape who I am now and, and my passions for hunting in the outdoors and, yep. and, uh, you know, passing that on to my children. Um, yeah. So NEK native, I, um, um, grew up, you know, on the athletic side of things, a lot of sports, just like you, uh, that was kind of like, that was kind of like what kept it kids active those days. We played as many sports as we could and, yep. uh, moving from one thing to the next each season. Um, and then later on, I, uh, so I actually went to, to college, uh, really, you know, and I joke what the only reason I went to college was to play, uh, play football, uh, to <laughs> yep. play any sport that I could. I just wanted to continue my athletic career uh, and I loved the outdoors. So I, I started my undergrad as a wildlife biology major nice. uh, at Plymouth State and unfortunately, but maybe in a, some weird way, fortunately, I, I was in a car accident. I was hit head on a uh, guy crossed the center line, uh, the week before football camp, my freshman oh, wow. year. Uh, yeah. And so that kind of changed things, uh, led to a lot of, a lot of rebu- rehabilitation, uh, time with the athletic trainers at Plymouth state. I was in, I was in great hands there that had a yep. great program for ATC as well. Um, but over the course of that, that next year, surgery, um, rehab and just getting back to being like, an athlete again. I mean, it took a lot away from me. Uh, I kind of found a love for, for a different type of biology being the human body. Mm -hmm. Um, and halfway through that next year, switched, switched majors, uh, switched schools. I wasn't able to play football. So I transferred back to, to my hometown in Linden and, um, kind of a long story, but I ended up graduating with a degree in strength conditioning and that's led me to, to what I'm doing now. So, Yeah, started work in New Hampshire, uh, down in the Hanover area, and then uh, a few years later opened up 
uh, my bricks and mortar here in Lindenville, uh, XIP training. We're in our, we're in our 13th, 14th year now. Okay. So, um, yep. and then Ridgeline came actually just at the, the, uh, beginning of COVID, uh, I wanted, I have worked with uh, backcountry athletes since the very beginning. Honestly, my very first true client, mm-hmm. uh, was training for an elk hunt and he worked with me. I, I was still finishing my undergrad. So we I've worked with backcountry athletes for some time and, and that's more than just the hunter. Yeah. People going on various different backcountry adventures and understanding that there's physical preparation that, you know, must happen to have an enjoyable, safe experience. So Absolutely. yeah, at the be- near the beginning of COVID, I had started to create a separate brand being Ridgeline Athlete so that we could direct our online training, uh, which we have a fully developed and we, we did at that time online platform, but I could kind of like push folks towards this, as I say, that the training for, for, um, this, these athletics outside the lines, mm-hmm. so to speak. Uh, because we're so focused on the more conventional athletes and, and, uh, athletics. Yep. And that's what led to, to Ridgeline athlete, um, which is a fully online platform, but also those that are close enough to, to come train with us in house. We have a really good, uh, squad of, of folks that are, um, you know, training with us in house as well. Yeah, I was so. going to say, I might have to take you up on that being yeah. that we're so close because hell yeah, I, uh, we started actually, I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but I started the, uh, big woods program yesterday yeah and uh you know it, it's great because you have video tutorials for everything but to have somebody in person yelling at you might be a little better but it's but it's everything is so simple it was really it was really cool to get into it yesterday so i'm glad to hear that um yeah and, and our our just to give a little shameless plug here the big woods program is really designed um to you know all of these programs are des- designed for the demands of the particular ac- activity yep. uh, or um, sport, if you will. And, um, the big woods program is, is more, we've worked with a lot of the, like the more Western hunter, Mm -hmm. uh, and there certainly is similarities, but there's also vast, um, differences in how we approach these, these, uh, two different sports really, if you will. So, uh, big woods is, this is the first year that I've had this program and and it's a team only. And the team is kind of cool because as you know, we get to interact through this, uh, it's an, it's an app based program. So folks, this is a download, it's a free download on your phone, yep. but that app carries my programming, yep. uh, and the videos and the coaching tutorials, et cetera. So in a, t- you could go on, on our website and purchase a, a program, but you can also be a part of a team where we're now we're interacting together. These, this program is liquid. If, if Greg has feedback, um, I can take that and make a change mm-hmm. immediately. I can, you know, message with athletes and, and that's a really cool, uh, community building, um, you know, atmosphere yep. and also a great form of accountability where, you know, if you and Adam are, are training <clears throat> in two different places, yeah. uh, you can still be interacting if you're in Colorado and, uh, Adam's down in Aruba hanging out with his girlfriend and <laughs> drinking great. friggin' cocktails then. <laughs> Sorry, Adam. <laughs> Greg told me to. Oh, well, we're going to give him shit the whole podcast here. Um, then you guys can still interact and have that sort of relationship. Absolutely. So it's really cool. It's not just a standalone, you know, product you purchase online. Yep. Yep. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just kind of getting into it here, but I've already noticed like what it'll do for you, not just the strength and conditioning, you know, which is, you know, getting, getting your win, getting, getting more muscle mass, but the, the lateral movements and stuff that's really going to help you hike in the mountains and the the flexibility side of it, I'm really liking so far. So yeah, you've said that a few times. Yep. Mobility gets so much cooler as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. I mean, it's like if you don't have the we call it movement capacity. If you don't have the capacity to move well yeah. through full ranges of motion, I mean, think about what a deer tracker. Oh yeah. Uh, or even if you're not tracking a deer, just moving through the woods fluidly. Yep. You know, I mean, I think about that a lot. That you know, if you want to be truly successful in the woods and and to fool ultimately and and to catch up to or you know harvest these animals year after year you have to move like like an animal oh yeah like i mean that might sound funny to some people but that is the way that it works it is and if you can find strategies for doing that more effectively you're gonna kill more deer oh yeah like plain and simple and mobility first and foremost like that all that is for those that are wondering what is mobility just think like the the 
your ability to take your joints yep. through full ranges of motion. Having yep. greater mobility allows you to do that. Yep. Where flexibility, think of that as more like your your muscles' ability to attain length and also to uh, to shorten as well. Like flexibility is more than just stretching. Uh, that's um, maybe for another conversation. But mm -hmm. these things are all in, integrated into these programs full of these modules where Greg can go on and be like, you know what, today I, I'm just going to work on my mobility. Yep. And you have the ability to do that through the app. Uh, I'm there with you. Uh, and being able to move better gives so much confidence. Big time. Um, big like, time. God, I mean, I just think about how many times you go under something and over something. Oh, yeah. And there's, a, like, there's a big difference of walking on a treadmill and going in the actual woods. and walking. Oh, yeah. So this this really helps you out with that. But, yeah, for sure. So what year did you graduate college up in Linden? So I added a little time because I changed my major. Yep. Um, and I graduated the first time in 2007. Yep. And then I went back. So I, I went to work and... As a trainer coach, yep. I had one more year of baseball eligibility. So I had a surgery partway through that for the shoulder, which stemmed from the accident. And that I had one more year. I said, you know what? I want to use that year. Uh, oh, I, yeah. pl I played, I was a four-year captain. Um, we, had a, we had a great run. Uh, and I went back, started a master's in education and played that last year of baseball. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah, we had a great, great team. Um, and yeah, so, and I never finished that. I opened the had the the opportunity to open here uh, halfway through there and and at some point I want to finish that oh, master's good. degree yeah. but yeah so that was kind of timeline there. I was up at Johnson the same time you were at Linden so we're we're kind of a quasi uh, uh, yeah uh, college brethren now because they combined everything. Who but. the heck knows what is going on <laughs> with those schools these days? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever I'll they're see. calling them. Yeah, I'll that's tell you true. my uh, you had a sad story about football. I'll tell you my sad basketball story. Yeah. So. I went up there to try out for the basketball team, um, played, you know, did pretty well in high school, went up there to try out for the basketball team, was feeling really good about myself, was in good shape, uh, playing the best ball I've ever played in my life. And uh, we went, there was kind of this preseason, like, get together, everybody was, you know, scrimmaging. And I'm like, it's Johnson, it's a small college, I'm going to be fine. I remember about the third trip down the court, this kid jumped over me to, uh, ended up dunking it, and uh, his sneaker went by my head. <laughs> and I'm like jumping as high as I can. And I'm like, oh, we're not in Kansas anymore, I guess. So, no. uh, I know even even Division three <laughs> college athletics is some, yeah. you know, really really great oh, yeah. uh, competition. It is. It you really know, it, is. It's so. it's awesome. I always encourage. We deal with a or we, we work with a um, large population of of high school and college yep. athletes, middle school up through. Um, and I always encourage that because oh, a yeah. lot of times in our kind of neck of the woods kids don't see that as an like a possibility yeah. Yeah. and division three division two athletics uh is awesome you know opportunity oh, yeah. to extend your career yep okay so we're sitting down here in your basement right now and i'm looking around and i see a lot of nice big rack bucks down here this is pretty awesome you got a we got a really cool little setup down here you got some fish mounted you got a bunch of euro mounts you got a bunch of regular mounts and this is this is like a cool little man cave down here yeah so. yeah it's uh i know i try to you know, it's like, I, I don't know. It's the kind of like that conflicting dilemma, I think, for a lot of sportsmen who truly value the animals that we hunt and harvest. Like, yep. I, you know, have that conversation. You entertain it with the non-hunters or just people who are kind of neutral. It's like, do I, is this like showboating this animal's life or are we, are we honoring that animal? And I think that, you know, obviously I feel the latter. Yep. Um, but it also is an opportunity to reflect on these really cool memories oh yeah uh, and these hunts that i had and and you know i there's a story behind every one of them um as anybody who has a mount on the wall can can tell you yeah uh, and it's just yeah yeah it's nice to have a place to be able to every one of reflect. these is, is hard hard won and hard fought and you ought to be proud of them and you know it's not there's a fine line there with the the way social media is now as far as uh you know putting pictures up of dead animals and stuff like that but um you know, any true sportsman, their you know their hearts in the right place, and you know I think this is this is great—a place of honor and a place to, you know, come down here and relive all the memories. You know, for so, sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, so no, we haven't really touched on your hunting ability. We've touched on <laughs> uh, we've touched on your yeah. uh, you know the athletic training and everything, but um, but you're you're quite the tracker in your own right, and you're uh you've, you've really had a lot of success in the Northeast Kingdom and also in Maine and um, 
where all do you usually concentrate during the fall? Um, well, I can't tell you that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my but, boss said, you know, I asked for them <laughs> when I used to work for the state, my, my, uh, my boss says, you know, you can have the month of November off. He goes, but you gotta oh. show me where you're hunting. So I just sent him a picture of the whole Northeast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty much it. The yeah. North, the Northeast. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I obviously would rather hunt on snow. Yep. Uh, so if there's an opportunity and I can get there, um, then that's where I'm going to try to be. Yep. I do have, you know, we got commitments with work and family too. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty blessed in that I'm able to, um, seems to be the theme with a lot of good trackers that they have the opportunity to take time off. Yeah. There's certainly good tracking days when I've been working and my brother who <laughs> he, he can, he's now got a great schedule and, and is able to take those days and we'll get a picture of either a dead deer or him the snow falling and i'm like <laughs> pulling my hair out but um yeah i mean um so i mean i i was fortunate to be raised by a guy who taught us woodsmanship at a very young age um you know to the point where we were flinching if we slammed the door because we knew that we were going to get whacked oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know when you got out of the truck or you know uh, couldn't take it right down to a, a brook fishing spot or you couldn't take a friend there yeah. and like you yeah. know and but how to move through the woods and and how to like um, just be a true woodsman, understand oh, yeah. wind and and um, shadows, et cetera. So you know we we were harvesting deer at a very young age, oh, yeah. um, and mostly stand hunting. Yep. Uh, my father is a is an exceptional uh, stand hunter, and I sometimes think he enjoys that more than yeah. the, the actual process of of stand location and you know oh, yeah. thinking about wind, et cetera. There's a lot to be said for that. I mean, absolutely. There's... The trackers are kind of their own fraternity, but there's also a lot of skill and other aspects yeah. of to which I'm trying to bring to the forefront a little bit. But, right, right. But yeah. So, I'll yeah. Interrupt. So, um, we, um, I think it was, I was 14. I shot my first deer with a bow. Yep. And, uh, and then I shot, uh, one or two other deer, uh, that year as well. Um, muzzleloader, uh, doe tags and rifle. And I just was, I just needed to hunt. Just dad, take me hunting. And, to all day sits, you know, I can remember sitting from daylight till dark, yep. um, which drove me nuts, but I would do it, you know, <laughs> if that's what it took. Oh yeah. And then there came a point where I remember at school one day, uh, I had shot a deer and then another boy had shot a deer and, and my deer wasn't as big. And it, I got kind of picked on about that. I was like, I went home and I was like, you know, I got picked on for shooting that 120 pound spike horn. Here I am like, you know, 15 years old. Yeah. And dad's like, well, if you want to shoot bigger deer, you've got to pass up the small ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, okay, well, <laughs> so I started doing that. And yep. then I made this rule for myself. I, I was at 16 years old. I'm, I'm not going to shoot anything. Had to have forks. And it wasn't long after that. It's got to be a six pointer or over. And, and that was a really fun way to challenge myself. Um, but then there came a point where it was like, I needed room to roam. Yeah. And I, I remember saying to my father, dad, I, I want to. I want to get up in the big woods. You know, I, I had heard enough from him yep. and reading books and he said, yep, yeah, okay. So he sent me to an area he had hunted or excuse me, that he had logged paper company land up in the Northeast kingdom. And, and, uh, no, <laughs> there was no onyx or anything then it was, <laughs> here it is on the map. And he drove me there. Yep. Um, uh, you know, earlier in the year, this is where you'll want to go in his old landing. And, yep. um, so anyway, um, I, I hoofed it up in the woods and started learning this, this, um, you know, section of mountain. And later that year we got some, some snow and I was right up there. And I remember that day, just as clear, I was coming up, slabbing along this side hill and I don't know, maybe 2000 feet or something. Yep. And, uh, it was quite a ways to get up there and it was just snowing so damn hard that like, you weren't going to find an old track. If you yep. found a track, that deer was close. And I, I found a, you know, a fresh track. Uh, and I said, oh boy, here we go. And I, you know, there was enough snow or it was hard to tell sex, nor was I talented enough at that point to know. <laughs> yeah. But I said, this is fresh and I'm following. Oh yeah. So away I went and I did, I don't know, maybe a, maybe a quarter mile or so. I worked my way down the edge of this ravine and I blew that deer up. It was a, it was a four pointer. Blew him up out from underneath the spruce tree at like 10 yards. And off he goes. And I had a, a Bolt uh, 7mm 08 medallion, uh, micro medallion. I still have it. Um, and he drops down over that ravine. And there's a brook in the bottom. And I'm 
you know, I was snowing hard and I had a one to four uh, Leopold on it. I pulled up and he, he stopped just for a second on the other side and it was about a hundred yards and boom, and I flattened him right there. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God, I, you know, I did this you thing. Did it. Holy yep. hell. So I, you know, cleaned the deer out, dragged it all the way out on my own and, and getting home and showing my, my father, my family, um, remember my uncle came over, um, you know, four point, like 136 pounds or yep. something. Um, I was hooked. Oh and yeah. That same year, my father had draw, dragged out a moose for Bryce Towsley. Yeah. Who, oh, yeah. who of course everybody knows from writing the Benoit books. Yep. And he had Bryce get an autographed copy of one of the books from the Benoit boys. Oh, and wow. so then, you know, I'm just like page and, and I still do every <laughs> oh, season. Yeah. I think everybody does. We have our pile of books at camp or wherever. <laughs> for sure. Um, and that really, then I was hooked. Um, and I had a, uh, Hey everybody, hope you're enjoying this episode of Staggered Cast. Just want to slide in here for a second and remind you guys to get geared up for your hunts this coming season. You can shop all our gear at staggeredgear.com, like the new Apex Merino base layers, glove sets, and a whole lot more. Plus, stay tuned for our upcoming jacket collection that'll be out in the next couple weeks. Some new colors for you guys to put to the test out in the field this year. We hope you enjoy the rest of this episode, and remember to get geared up at staggeredgear.com. But this girl's uh, brother... Um, big deer tracker and, and a great woodsman, also a logger. Yep. Uh, and he, he took me up North. Okay. Um, and that, that first year, so I was, I don't know, 21, 22, I'd had success in, in the, you know, big woods in Vermont yep. and, uh, hunting with him and, and alone and, um, got to go way up North and experience a, you know, a true Northern hunt and shot a, shot a nice buck. Um, and that was a 200 pounder. Wow. And then first time up there, first time up. <laughs> well, you gotta, you gotta hit us with that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it's not as, uh, it was, so here's how it worked. We, it was probably the second day it was dry ground. Yep. And for two days, I believe maybe two days, it was relatively warm. Of course I'm like, holy shit. Like yeah. this is huge. Like I, I got a, my old, he told me to get a GPS. I didn't have a GPS. I had a compass and I was like, well, you're not going to, you're going to get lost. And you know what I'm like? Well, oh, don't yeah. worry about me. Just point, I can find my way out of the woods. And yep. so, um, I did though. It was very humbling. And I think that every hunter these days, I think that that's something that hunters miss mm -hmm. is this opportunity to be humbled by the out, the great outdoors. Yep. And you know, like, can you honestly, can you go out in the woods and could you go out in the woods, take a track and go with only a compass in your pocket? Mm -hmm. And the answer for most people is no. The answer for most is no. And I, and I think that we're, we're as many of us that are of a generation now where we didn't have the opportunity to utilize these electronics and mapping, yep. et cetera. Yep. Like m my success is deeply rooted in the fact that my woodsmanship skills, uh, what I call hunter agility yep. is, is so much more refined. And, and that's simply because that's the way we were raised. That oh, yeah. was all we had. So, yeah, I mean, anyway, um, it was, we got snow back to the hunt. We, was, we got snow and a little bit enough that we could do some tracking mm -hmm. and, um, not going to give names, but he took off on a, on a track and he'd been in this country before and was on that deer. Most of the day I had tracked a uh, deer on an adjacent Ridge, came back kind of into the area. Um, and I'm like, all right, where is he? You know, I'm going to try to find him. It's about one thirty, two o'clock. Another friend had joined us to stay, you know, at the camp, uh, with us, uh, just an old camper we brought up mm -hmm. and we finally got him, got him on the radio. I mean, we're guys that will have a radio if, if you're with other people. Um, so you can check in at the end of the day and maybe get a ride home, Yep. but you're not going to bug somebody all day long. Like, yeah. um, we just don't do that. We mostly hunt alone. Yep. Um, so anyway, got him and he said, uh, Adrian, I'm coming for this, you know, and if you can get there, maybe you can get in front of it. <laughs> and I said, all right, well, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'll do my best. <laughs> and I did. And long, long story short, um, uh, I, it was just like rabbit hunting. Actually. I, he came over the ridge on one deer and then he came on the radio and he said, I just got onto a bigger track and it's going right down into that, you know, that swamp in the bottom. Uh, and that's the last you're going to hear from me. 
So like, I got to get serious is what he was saying. So, all right. You know, and I got in, you know, you just find travel routes and corridors. And I think that that, you know, in this situation, it worked out. I got into a spot where I thought that deer might try to escape. And I was right. Made the shot and killed the deer. Um, But it, for somebody that's, again, back to this whole idea of woodsmanship and those, those skills, like that intuition, the hunting intuition. Yeah. That's something that many of us might take for granted but it puts meat in the freezer oh, definitely. and in those situations, like it, it will, it'll lead to success. Now, yeah. you know, I, other guys might try that too. You know, that's a hard thing to do to get in front of somebody else on a, on a buck and, and Big time. to shoot it. We don't do it often. It, it's happened normally. I think it's happened three times to me, uh, since I was however, over 20 years of doing this. Yep. Um, and it's always with somebody that I know really well. Oh yeah. And I've hunted with, and we're like, just like, you know, in athletics. Oh, yeah. Where you know your teammate and how they're going to move and respond to that play. And, and I, you know, so anyway, that yeah, was that's, it. That's, that's awesome. And it is, uh, I, you know, I've gone in the woods with my buddies multiple times, and we go in on opposite mountains, and we end up in the same exact spot. And right. I, know the, I know a lot of times the woods will guide you, you know, you take the path of the least resistance, but there is something to that hunter's intuition that you're talking about. Um Cause I've seen it work and you know, in our cases too, but, um, you being in good shape too. And him saying, get there, that, de- that definitely didn't, didn't hurt. I Absolutely. Mean, me and Adam were tracking, uh, big sexy last year <laughs> and he's on the radio. Get there. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going as it is fast as I can. And the most <laughs> fucking, sorry to swear, most stressful <laughs> form of hunting. And for us, it will happen like at the end of a day. Oh yeah. You're checking back in. For like, sure. do I need to pick that guy up? You yeah. know, cause like I said, we do our own thing. Yeah. Um, but it is so stressful and I don't know how many times we've, okay, I'm, I'm there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, I think you need to be a half mile down the road. Yeah. So you do yeah. the damn, you know, country boy shuffle down the road, trying to, you know, watch in the woods and, mm-hmm. and yeah, then you get sure. there and they come back Well, I'm at your tracks from where you were before. Oh, <laughs> damn. And it's like, yeah, I'm never doing this yeah. again. Yeah. But we did that a couple times last year. Uh, he told me to move and he came, came through right where I was. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, this sucks, but there's it's fun so, when it works out. I know, know when it rarely happens, but, um, yeah. a story, uh, my brother and I, um, we've done it a few times. Um, recently we did it on a deer that, so, um, he and I, my brother, Nick and I had, had each tracked this deer, uh, over the course of three years. Yep. So I originally started this deer. Um, it was an early season snow and I, I took that deer. That was a, that was a long day in a big mountain. Yep. Um, and that deer was just searching and he finally found does and I found him up on top of this mountain, um, and didn't, didn't make a shot. Uh, I didn't even get a shot. Yep. I busted him out of there down the mountain. We went and I went a long, long ways. So I had some you know, I had, that was the first time I'd followed him. Well, then later in the year I got on him again Yep. and he had some tendencies. Uh, and of course this is with now mapping and on X. So yep. I'm able to track these things over time. Uh, the following year I missed the deer on dry ground within, within yards of where I'd taken him through the year before. Mm-hmm. Uh, later that season, uh, my brother got on him, uh, and took him around for a day and, as we compared tracks, it's like, wow, look at that. Yeah. You know, like he same followed the same route, you know, right through there. Just an, an old buck with a lot of, you know, tendencies and habits that he didn't like to break because he knew good ways through there. Yep. So the the third year comes around and uh I didn't really hunt that area a whole lot. We got up there later in the season and my brother went up in and, and checked the this mountaintop where he'd found him uh, the year before, mm-hmm. and he found him. And he tracked him the rest of the day. I don't think he ever really got super close, if I remember. Excuse me, he did. He jumped that deer, and close enough that he was like, okay, I'm going to peel off, and we're, I'm going to come back in the morning. So we went back in the morning, and I said, well, you go get on the track, and I'm going to go check one of those escape routes from years prior. Well, I got there and the track was literally right. I mean, it, it gave me goosebumps. I followed, I, I told Nick, I said, I'm on him. So, um, you know, if we're going to try to do this, I think we know what we got to do. Oh, yeah. I don't need to say a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it followed two like 
between trees that exactly yeah. on the route. I went over a mile where you can't see the other track underneath. Wow. Eerie. Yeah. Eerie. So like, you know, it's the same deer and you know, long story short, um, we, it worked out, you mm -hmm. know, and it got mm -hmm. in front and killed that deer and it was a beautiful buck. And that meant so much to us to be able yeah. to use this, you know, this, this, um, these, again, the experience in the woods and the time on that deer oh, to, yeah. to put it all together. But it's extremely rare that you can do that and oh, get yeah. in front of somebody like that. For sure. Um, for but sure. when it happens, it's fun. To, if it's with somebody you really, you know, enjoy hunting with. Yeah. And you sync up good with, I've had, I've had hunting partners that were like that. And then I've had some guys where I'm like, I'm going in on this side of the road. You go on this side. Don't yeah. cross the road. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, exactly. Don't, because it, you know, it mucks you up and you hate oh, to yeah. do that to somebody else. So, I know. But, uh, um, but when, uh, so coming into your house, I saw a, a hell of a nice elk hang in there. Yeah. Um, so uh, my question is, are you heading out west this year to do some hunting or? No, I've got a really close friend, another good, uh, Northeast Kingdom yep. deer hunter who moved out there to elk hunt a little over a decade ago. Okay. Um, and he, I've been fortunate enough to have him as a mentor. Uh, in, in elk hunting, which I've become obsessed with, but unfortunately staffing and business and such, um, yep. I, I haven't made it out in the last two years, this year and last year, uh, I hunted three years in a row out West. Um, I'm hooked. It's <laughs> fucking awesome. So how was the, uh, the, how was your program uh, as far as getting you ready for out there? Oh, were, I was were you fine. able to go right I've in? I've never there? had an issue. Yep. Guys talk a lot about elevation, you know, problems. Lack of oxygen. Yeah. And elevation sickness is, is basically that it's, uh, we're putting our body into a hypoxic environment where there's basically a, a lack of oxygen. Yep. So altitude, you know, is, is an opportunity for that to happen. Um, I, I do feel that, you know, so true elevation training, you have to spend time at elevation and there's this yep. like ramp up period. Yep. Uh, no hunter that's traveling to go hunt out there is going to have a week to no. do that. So your, your, your physical preparation can play a huge role in just our ability to cycle blood to the muscle. So blood arterial, you know, our, 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 um, our, our oxygen level within our, our blood is super dense. Mm -hmm. So the carrying capacity of this oxygen to the muscle, uh, is, is super high. If we can teach the body how to use it. Yeah. And that's where having a good aerobic foundation, think exercise and, uh, where oxygen can supply the demand, yep. which is really like the demands. If we want to do like an, a needs assessment on a big woods hunter, mm -hmm. we're not sprinting through the woods. You know, there might be the occasional time where like I jump a buck and, and honestly, that has happened on a lot of these here where yep. I jump that deer, I use my hunter intuition, I make a run for it, you get to the top of the ridge or come around this, you know, you know, curve in the softwood or whatever, and you catch them and you kill them. Yep. And it worked out and, and you had to sprint, but the 99.9% .9 of our hunting is done at what we would call like a zone two. Yep. And that is a sustainable pace. Okay. If you're not moving at a sustainable pace, how are you going to go all day long? Yeah. You know, and that's the nature of the beast. I, I tell people all the time, Western hunting is way easier than tracking bucks in the Northeast. Really? I'm sorry, Western hunters, if you're listening to this, that. well, <laughs> it is. And the guys that are from the Northeast, like my friend, Kevin. Yeah who's done both and has been successful. He's one of the most successful elk hunters I know. Yep. Um, the terrain is easy going. It's steep, but it doesn't have underbrush and all these yeah, blow freaking downs blow and, downs and yeah. there is blow. And you get a lot of deadfall, especially with all the beetles and the burns and okay. stuff. But the ground is hard, firm. You're not walking in snow, nor are you doing it in these dang rubber boots. Yep. Um, which, <laughs> oh God, I'm going to find a better option here one of these days. But, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so it, I feel as though like it's much tougher. But besides the point, like this ability to get blood uh, to the muscle, that's the key. Yeah. And having a good aerobic foundation, like for those that are listening right now, whether you purchase a program or you join a team with Ridgeline or somewhere else, yeah. like I I use this kind of analogy all the time that first and foremost, you want to, you want to train the variables that are going to kill you first or the variable is going to keep you alive the longest. Okay. Okay. Hunting aside, mm -hmm. you know, and granted back in the day, like that was how we survived. Yeah. You know, we were all at one point, you know, a, a hunter gatherer. Yep. Uh, we can't deny that. Um, 
So that is in our genetic makeup. So Mm -hmm. anti-hunter or not, um, don't get me going down that path. But (laughs) um, so yeah, having an aerobic foundation like heart health, uh, cardiovascular health, and being able to deliver oxygen to the muscle is the most effective way to be a better, um, a big woods hunter, a hunter in general that isn't going to be necessarily sprinting after their game. Humans have more, uh, a more refined, like our endurance, that's our skill set. Humans, like we evolved um, to be able to go for long periods of time. Yep. Uh, we have brain capacity that allows us to make better, like we're, we can, we can uh, rationalize and we can make these decisions, um, you know, based on past experience, et cetera. And we can carry things. Yeah. You know, that was one of the, th- those are key That's attributes huge. that kept yeah. us alive for so long and, and able to evolve. Yep. So using that like to our, um, in, in tracking the buck, uh, like we need to have the ability to go all day long yep. and supply enough oxygen to the muscle to be able to do it. Yep. Uh, really that's what's most, uh, most important right off, mm-hmm. um, our aerobic capacity and then having the strength to be able to do that because a, a weak person will fatigue quicker climbing the mountain, Yep. you know, so that's going to be greater energy expenditure. Uh, so there's a great reason to, to build your muscular strength. Yep. Uh, to support the, again the activity, the needs assessment of tracking a buck or or just hunting the big woods all day long. Okay. Uh, and then like we talked about before, having the mobility to be able to move fluidly through the woods. Yeah. Uh, and and that's something I think that you know now it, it call it my hunting career, uh, just my hunting experience uh, over all these years. That's something. Those are the things that I focus on most now that I feel lead to the greatest success. Typically when I leave those like moving fluidly through the woods, when mm-hmm. I start to get a little bit reckless, like shit, I got to rush because I got to get here to do that. I something typically it's then that I screw something up. Yep. Or um one thing I love, move vertically through the woods. Now what I mean by that is like everything in the woods grows vertically. Yep. Right? Like trees, etc. like Deer are horizontal. That's one of the things that we tend to recognize uh, from a visual acuity standpoint. Yep. The back of the deer uh, or these things that kind of stick out. Uh, but if you're moving horizontally through the woods, like if I'm over here and then I'm to my right and yep. then I'm to my left, rather than, okay, that track might be meandering a little, I don't have to. I'm going to pick the straightest line I can. And if I feel as though that deer is 300 yards out in front of me, in that general vicinity, I'm going to move in the straightest line possible, as vertical as I possibly can yep. to from point A to point B. And if I have to change when I get there, well, then I will. But it's not going to be lots of these horizontal movements. Yeah. And that was something I learned years ago from Del Green, okay, um, yep. who, another very uh, talented. And um, Well, that, that, that point you just made about getting careless, I mean, that's a big thing in the woods. And, and I know I've found myself doing that in the past where you, you get a little weak. You get, maybe get a little dehydrated. Maybe your muscles are starting to hurt a little bit and you let your guard down for that one second yeah. and there goes the buck and yeah. you're done. Yeah. So, you know, this is, this is why we need to be at, uh, you know, at, at, at our best that we can be yeah. when the season I starts, think, you know? Uh, and that's absolutely spot on. Now, cognitively, mm-hmm. our ability to like stay on task, yeah. right? Like uh, tracking a buck is super like demanding of our our cognitive, cognitive, mental, you know, like mind space, you yep. start to get distracted as, as uh, Lanny or Larry would say in his old book, I mean, you're thinking about what your wife's doing with a milkman while you're away, <laughs> like you're, you're screwed yeah. because you're distracted yeah. and you can't be, you've no. got to be so focused. Well, that, that requires energy. Yep. It's no different than the, the kid that can't sit still in school. Yeah. Like, yeah, trackers need to be, a, we're typically the people that got to move, 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 but our brains have got to be focused on the task at hand as well as all the other variables around us. Yeah. Again, it's athletics. Oh yeah. You know, it's like our sport is just happening in this type of, you know, this is our platform, our venue. Uh, and we have to be able to recognize our agility, like hunter agility is like responding to everything. The blue Jay making that sound up there. That was maybe like a, you know, alert signal or why is that squirrel? Why'd he just take off from over there when he had a nice bite to eat, you know, down there and like all these different things, this is intuition, you know, the, all, how the buck moved through there or a recognizing that, Hey, we're going to have the wind is changing or everything all at once. And that's super demanding. 
I think your background in baseball is good for that too, because when you're sitting there at shortstop, you're always, you, you, you got to keep sharp. You're always wondering, you're trying to think two steps ahead. Where's the play going to go to if the ball goes here, goes there. I think athletics is a, is a big help for hunting as far as keeping that mental acuity and focus. You Um, talk to a lot of these big, uh, these talented deer trackers, they have an athletic background. Oh, for sure. And you know, another thing, and this never gets talked about, um, in the training, call it like the hunter athlete training space. There's a, there's a few things that you must have to be successful going all day long, day after day. And we talked about some of the, the energy system demands, you know, like having good aerobic capacity, Yep. but you need vision. Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because if you can't see them, uh, you're going to, you're going to struggle and you need, you need good feet ankles. Now, those are two components that I think a lot of guys leave out that will absolutely get you more deer. Uh, and give you more opportunities. Uh, vision can be trained. Okay. Your, your diet, how you live, the, how much screen time are you using? Like, uh, blue light blocking glasses. Uh, do you use moisturizing drops in your eyes? All things that guys are like, what the heck is this guy talking about? Well, I'll tell you what, man, I've got, you know, relatively adequate eyes, good vision. I want to keep it for those that, you know, are in the same boat that recognize I need to be able to see that animal maybe before he sees me or fast enough to make a decision on what I'm going to do in like a split second. Yeah. Like that's vision is that's how agility works. It's a decision, like how quick you can make that decision accurately. Okay. Based on past experience, that's hunter agility. That's hunter in all of it in, in encapsulated in like two seconds. Yeah. And then making that shot. I mean, so the my biggest buck there. Um, that's a great example. So, uh, I, I, that was dry ground Mm -hmm. and I came into this brand new area, never been there in my life. And I, the way we'll do it in dry ground, we'll pick a particular region and I'll say, okay, I'm going to start here. I'm going to go up and down and then I'm going to drive 10 miles down the road or five miles or two miles, whatever, you know, again, whatever I feel is the right, right place to go in next up and down. I'm just looking for bucks. I'm scouting for when there is snow. Yeah. But if I find a buck and I think it's fresh, I'm going to hang out there and, you know, still hunt and, and be a hunter, be a predator. Well, that deer, I didn't go too, too far off the landing and I came across, uh, a, oh my God, what a big track. And I didn't, at first it, there's a lot of moose in the area Yep. and it was in the leaves and I was like, oh yeah, it could be a moose. Uh, and then I see her walked right up and rubbed this brown ash. And I was like, oh boy. Okay. So this is a nice box. Of, you see where he really had his way with that tree. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm looking, I mean, that deer weighed 253. So I'm it, looking at him right it now. ain't hard to, it ain't hard to follow him in the leaves when it they're big like, like that. looks like there's like a Holstein in his family know, tree or something know, it's somewhere lot, along the line. The rack, <laughs> you know, the rack, like a lot of those bucks, big old body. And I don't know Who what cares that. cares the rack secondary. The yeah. The, well, yeah. so anyway, I, I said, well, I'm watching where he's going, yep. but this is dry ground and the wind was horrible. Yep. It's early season. And I said, well, I'm going to follow him for a little bit and just get a general bead, read the country. And I knew that, wow, I, I think maybe there's a big cut, maybe a mile away. Maybe, maybe not even. I said, I don't think he's going to, I think he's somewhere in between here and there. There's a nice little shelf up here. Yep. So I'm going to work my way up this tote road and try to get the, you know, wind maybe in my favor and grunt. I grunt a lot. Uh, Corey Ryder exposed me on uh, <laughs> the Northwoods <laughs> podcast um, the other day. I heard an episode he had on, and I had taught him about that. He thought I was full of shit when I first told him that, but I grunt all the time. Oh, yeah, it works. I grunt, I snort wheeze, I run like a deer. I do all those things because that's what my dad taught me to do, and it yeah. friggin' worked when I was a kid, and I'm not going to stop because I've killed a lot of these bucks here are from doing stuff like that. Yep. Uh, it's time consuming or well, what What the hell else are you going to do? Exactly. It yeah. use a little more energy. Yep. But anyway, so I'm, you know, I'm running like a deer up the hill and trying to sound like, a, you know, I'm grunting here and there and stop, scrape once in a while. That's all I was doing and I'm working my way up and I had just stopped and grunted and I was going to have to move into new woods. It was, okay. I was leaving kind of this old grown in tote road and moving into some more open mixed softwood, hardwood. Uh-huh. And anytime I approach an edge, I always stop and I'm like, oh, you know, if the buck isn't here, I don't want to, I don't want to make my way through this strategically. Yep. I said, all right, well, I'm going to kind of work up through there. And I took one step, 
well, that deer wasn't far away. And when I took that next step after grunting, uh, whether he could see me from where he was or whatever, he took off. So he took off. I couldn't see him. He was, he was above me. And at first it was this pounding of hooves. And I was like, ah, it's a moose. I'd already jumped some, Yep. but I'm always pulling up. I pull up on every partridge I see. Oh yeah. That's an opportunity to practice and swing your rifle. Uh, if I can get a partridge in the scope, uh, when I'm hunting with a scope gun, uh, yep. to me, that was a killed bird, you oh, yeah. know? So I pull up and I'm right there and he just came into this opening for a second. I saw enough rack and boom. And you know, all I had was a Texas heart shot. Boom. So I, and then he disappeared and he was gone. He was headed for that, that clear cut, which was a wide open cut. Yeah. So I take off running and I'm running. Cause if I can catch him in that cut, I mean, I assume I missed. I didn't go 20 yards and he's coming right back at me. Wow. So then I pow, pow, pow. And I, I <laughs> put him down there and he yep. goes like, holy crap, that's a big, big buck. Yep. Well, I had hit him right up the touch hole, the first, the yep. first shot. Oh, and yeah. he was hurt, you know, and he was dead, but he had turned probably when he saw the, the opening and came back. Yep. Um, but that's a, a good, uh, example of a quick shot, you know, where, I was, I was pulled up. I recognized what was going on. I was ready and then boom, made the shot when I recognized this animal as a, you know, a mature buck that I wanted to shoot. And it happens just like that. Yeah. Your vision is, is what is relaying these messages. Oh yeah. Experience plays a huge role. Yep. You know, just like the baseball player that's turning a double play, the more times they practice that, the, the reverse layup and, you know, your sport of basketball, yep. like you need reps. Oh yeah. And I think that again, back to being a woodsman, you want to kill more deer, spend time in the woods and recognizing these situations so that when you are put into the maybe one time a season opportunity, oh, yeah. you can capitalize on it. Or like you said, with it, with the quick decision-making too, like make it part of your routine. You're doing your, you're doing your fitness routine for your body, but go out every night with your gun, mm-hmm. whether you use a scope or whether you're open sights. And this is what I do every night. I just go out 10 times. I pull up on my, my archery target Yeah. and it's just how quick can I acquire that target and touch the trigger off? I mean, I'm not shooting every time, um, but it's just how quick, you know, and I've, and I've noticed like having both eyes open when, the, when I pull the scope up, yeah. you know, might shave a 10th of a second off. So just yeah. stuff like that too, makes a big, di- you know, you Raps. look, you look silly doing it. My wife's like, what the hell are you doing? But it might make the difference between getting one and not getting yeah, one, you know? Yeah, you know, dogs so. get all fired up when I leave the house <laughs> with a gun. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's vital. And I, you know, yeah. there's, um, I mean, I. And I got to apologize to the, uh, to the, the uh, listeners right now, because we have you on giving us this advice and we just had Lanny on a couple weeks ago. And he said that all you need to, you know, to have energy on the track is a log of salami. So I don't know. Like, <laughs> I heard that. I tell you what, when, when Lanny got started down that path, I was like, oh boy, where are we going to go here? He was spot on. Oh yeah. And you know what? He, he likes to play it off. Like I'm just a normal Joe. I've yeah. got a beer gut. <laughs> that dude was a savage in his younger days. And he was in shape. I yeah. mean, yeah, he might've had a beer belly, but that dude could go. He and could go. He could, and he could see and he could shoot. And so- he plays it off, but he was a, he was an athlete in his own right. For sure. So. Yeah. No, I mean, having, having fat, uh, as a, so when it comes back to like the slow, steady state yes. activity, yeah. fat's primary, like one of the, the primary sources of fuel. Yep. So you, you must have some, you know, you need to be able to utilize that, that fuel for the activity. Yep. Uh, carbohydrates are important as well. And then having a good electrolyte balance, for uh, sure. salts, et cetera. But yeah, I mean, it's. Tracking is, is so much about its intuition and like making good decisions. And a lot of it, no, no new hunter is ever going to figure out right away. Yep. Um, you just need to do it. You just got to do it. Get it's out getting, there and do it. It's getting harder with no snow, but I mean, you still, hard. you still have a handful of days a year where you can do it and you can still get out there in the winter and practice a little bit, but, um, it's just one of them things you've got to, you can't do it and you know, you can't. Yeah can't read a book and be good at it. It just, it helps, but it doesn't, it doesn't do, you know, what you need it to do. But, um, yeah. so is that, is that huge racked one, a, a tracking buck right there? So that's an interesting story. Um, not, no, it isn't the, this one scored like we were talking about before we got on. Um, yep. I don't really scored a whole lot of these, but that one was worth scoring. He was yep. 143. 
Um, so that year, I had kind of a bad run with Thanksgiving Day. Uh, I'll show you something here. Yeah. <laughs> this is where it freaking started. Uh oh. Thanksgiving Day. Uh oh. Tell the I'm tell looking, the audience what you're holding. I'm there. looking at a busted off antler right here, and it looks like a, a, a off a bruiser. Too. Oh my god! So holy. I'll cow. start with that. That was Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I'll start with this. This kind of leads in a roundabout way to that one. Yep. Um, Thanksgiving day, I'd, I'd already killed, um, a nice deer. So I'd killed that one in, in, uh, Vermont. Yep. Uh, that 215. Okay. And I was in another state. Um, we had great snow and I get on this deer on Thanksgiving day, beautiful track, wicked deep snow and cold. I mean, it was 2008. I guess yep. some guys might remember that year I think yep. it was 18 19 oh, yeah. deep deep snow and cold that Thanksgiving day with the wind we were somewhere around 20 below oh, yeah. in the area the wind chill yeah so but it was windy and it was a killing day and I get on that deer and we're plugging along I went through one bed uh put him through another bed and he was kind of working his way into a um area that I had a feeling he'd be spending you know the rest of the day in that yeah. sort of weather well i came to this uh like really steep incline where i was it was almost ledgy but i could make it up yep. and at the bottom of it i took my first step and i slipped because my boots had caked up and froze with ice okay so i mean the wind's whipping so hard i bang my boot on that tree and that was i think a mistake um i don't know if he could hear it or not yep. but i climbed my way up this bluff and I get up there, and he was bedded in an old moose bed, oh, maybe 45, 50 yards from me. Now, yep. the wind was whipping so bad, you couldn't hear us talking that far away. Yeah. But I feel like he heard that, and he was gone. He had no other reason to go. The wind yep. wasn't blowing towards him. So off he goes. Oh, son of a... So I get on the track, and away we go. And it's whipping so hard, I didn't, I didn't wait. I knew, that, I knew that he had bedded twice before that. That was his third bed in about you know a two, three-mile stretch. Uh, I said, I'm going to get right on him. So away we went. I was cold too. Yeah. So I didn't go another mile and he had bedded in a really funky spot and you tell he didn't like it. He bedded down in, it was too tight. You couldn't see out of it. Yep. And he jumped out of it and ran and he went across kind of a swaley area and up the mountain he goes. I said, okay, well, he's going to be up there. So I get trucking up the mountain again. I didn't wait and I didn't go a quarter mile from where he bedded there. Yep. Yep. And I peek around some softwoods and there he is bedded at like, I don't know, 80 yards uphill. Yeah. And he was bedded like the weather does weird things to him. And he wasn't like head facing out. Yep. His ass end was out, but I could see his head, but there was so much snow. All I could see was just the very back of him. Yep. And then his head. I was like, well, I'm not going to shoot him in the head at 80 yards. There no. was some, you know, a little wispy stuff there. I said, I'm just going to put it through the snow. I, that, that 200 pounder there in New Hampshire, I did that. Yep. And so anyway, I, you know, I'm holding right there. I said, all right, yeah, pow. And he jumps up and I was, it was so cold. I was wearing a big leather mitten on my <laughs> left hand yeah. with a hand warmer in it. Yeah. And, you know, not that that was an excuse, but I just, I can remember pumping that action as he takes off and then he stands 15 yards away, standing behind a, yep. this like, like branched off birch tree. And I could just see his hind end, like this rump. And then I could just see his rack sticking out and it's like his nose. And it's like, well, I'm just going to shoot him in the butt, you know, on the hind end here. So pow, and off he goes. And when that <laughs> one, I actually brought my gun down. I made a mistake. Yeah. He, I really felt like he was already hit. I was just putting another one in him. I brought that gun down and he went across a really nice opening <laughs> and I saw every bit of him and there wasn't a hole in him. Oh, no. <laughs> and I got one more shot at him as he took off and I got up to the bed still thinking like I, he's going to be dead somewhere. Yeah. I found that horn. Oh, that antler was laying in the bed. And I said, Oh my God. I Son somehow God. I hit him. I, I shot my gun when I, I never caught up to that deer. He went the rest of the day, got back in the truck, shot the gun, gun shot. Great. It was me. Somehow, yeah. or I don't know if I hit something in the snow and it, but somehow it got that antler. Yeah. So my feeling is I just, I messed. And then <laughs> rather than let him walk out from that tree on the second shot. Yeah. I just rushed it. Just rushed it. You know, and yeah. that's again, it, even, even as with experience, you make those mistakes and it you is do. what it is. 
it's you get some deer you get and you shouldn't get them. You have no business getting them. Right. Some that you, and some work the other way. Yeah. It just works against yeah. you. So you got to be thankful for when it all does work right. But right. What a memento though. Oh, Holy cow. Son of a, I was almost worse. You know, I got back to the truck, get a video of my face to like yeah. my beard. You, I couldn't even open my mouth. Yeah. You know, it was so frozen up and I had this, this antler. So that was Thanksgiving day. It didn't work out the following year. We had some history on a particular mountain range uh, with a real nice buck we called Long Legs. Yep. Uh, my buddy had shot at it in year one. I had tracked it later that year. Yep. We got on him a, um, again the next year, and that was that would be this following season uh, from this this one. And I got on that deer on Thanksgiving Day, and this was the second time that year I had tracked him. My buddy had tracked him already. Yep. Long legged animal. I mean, I'm a short legged. Frenchman and I, I had to really truck to keep up to him. Oh yeah, deep snow yep. again, real deep snow. He was headed up. He was with a doe, and I knew he wasn't far. And I, I didn't go two miles. And I came out of some real nice softwood and crossed like an old wet. It would you would think like a road, but it was just where the wet didn't allow things to grow up. Yep. And the way that I popped out into it, there was an old dead like a four foot high softwood tree. Yep. And I happened to be right there with that in front of me. And then I saw the buck laying behind a tree yeah. at maybe, I don't know, 40 yards away. And I could see his nose on one side of the tree and a little bit of horn. And I could see his hind end on the other side. And I said, well, I could see enough of his hind end. I'm going to put it right in there. Well, I shot and off he goes. And I... It got another shot off as he took off, but I really felt like that bullet was in him. I got up there and there was no blood and I could see, it was very obvious where the bullet hit, maybe like two feet underneath him. Yeah. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I really missed by a lot. Yeah. And I chased that deer for the rest of the day and I caught up to him a few more times, never got a shot. Damn. Didn't get him. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go again. The, the, the following year, Thanksgiving day. And I'm like waking up in the morning and going like, well, boys. Are you ready for another sad story today? Yeah. Here we go. Well, I we had snow, and the sad part of that day was that uh, my both myself and uh, buddy Skip got on bucks, and the, both the bucks went down, and we lost snow. Okay. So it was about 2.30, 3 o'clock, Thanksgiving Day, and I had a spot where I had killed one of these. I killed a... One of these deer here anyway. Yep. It was yep. just under that one right there. It was okay. just just under two hundred pounds. And that was a that was a fun uh hunt I tracked and yep. was successful. And I went up into that same area, uh, took a similar uh path up in that, that one took me on and got up in there. It was super foggy, you know, like when it's warm and the snow's melted off. Yep. There was just a like a little bit of snow left. I was working an edge of of pretty tight softwood and hardwood. I was really looking down into the hardwood. And as I worked that edge, uh, I would grunt, you know, and I would stop, grunt, mm -hmm. and stop, grunt, and work my way along. Well, then I hear some crashing. And I heard it. I was like, oh, boy, that's I got moose coming. So yep. I, I'm going to get video of these moose running by. <laughs> yep. They're coming at me. I just started to reach back, and I see a doe. I said, oh, boy. You know, reach oh, for oh, my oh, phone. Oh, <laughs> I said, all right, here comes this doe. This doe, Greg. Ran by me from me to you. Oh, yeah. The buck was not far behind. And I shot him in about 10 yards. And that it flattened him right there. That's awesome. Two shots done. I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, there goes the- He broke the curse. The curse. <laughs> and that deer, so that, he didn't weigh, he was not a lot left of him. Um, I think that his frame probably gave him, you know, when, when he was, earlier in the season, he was probably low 200s. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he was 186 on Thanksgiving wow. Day. Uh, that year. Well, most and that guys was, would have stayed home and uh, watched football and, and kind of called it a loss that day. So you stuck with it. You, you know, and you that's, know? I'm not going to say that those thoughts didn't cross my mind. It's like at 2.30 yep. when I come down off and I'm out of snow and yeah. and it's like, golly, you know, this, this isn't going to work. Yeah. Or, hey, let's use some of our past experience. Uh, we all keep notes in our journals uh, and I'll reflect on those. Okay, well, on this date, four years ago, you know, what was I doing? Or last year or whatever yep. okay here i always record the weather you know and what the weather is doing on that particular day yep and that could be so helpful in helping you build again that intuition 
you know, and that, you know, some people might call that luck, but it's like guys, I mean, I'm not trying to brag, but you know, when you go into somebody's house and they've got a lot of horns on the wall and they do it year after year, that's like, yeah, you make your own luck. Yeah, exactly. And it, it comes a point where that luck is you putting yourself in these opportunities and making the shot. Exactly. You know, like, exactly. And you got to make the shot. You really, that's, that's honestly that's the, a big part of it. That's a some huge people part. Have, some people have a huge problem with that. Yeah. They can do everything but that part. Yeah. So, but um, what you said with the, uh, keeping journals and stuff. I mean, I think if, uh, I think if some psychologists saw some of the Excel spreadsheets I have and probably some of the stuff you have, they probably put us in a so, loony bin. But only cause we're, we're going down <laughs> that, that route. Yeah. And I know we're probably getting to close to the mark where people start to lose interest. Oh, that's all right. We're telling deer stories, damn I'm not it. losing interest. <laughs> so here, this is one of the geeky things that I do in my kind of a scientist here. And Adrian's sorts. got his laptop open. Up yeah. So gotta, here, here's, we got here, a spreadsheet. Here we go. Here. And Greg, I'll have to kill you if you, <laughs> if you, uh, <laughs> bring your phone out or anything to look at this. So what I do is I, every day yeah. that I hunt, I record the state that I'm in yep. and the miles that I that I uh, go on that yep. particular day. And then the number of deer sightings, shots taken, was I on a 200 pound track and did I, Excellent. Was, was there a buck down? So at the end of the year, this is kind of cool. So in this particular, this was 21, 2021, uh, don't tell my wife this, but 20, 29 <laughs> days of hunting. And, and those will include like a three hour hunt. Oh yeah. You know, I did, you'll see some of these tracks are two miles, you know, a mile and a half, three quarters of a mile. I record it. And so I get in the 29 days, it was 6.96 miles a day. I had 28 deer sightings yep. that year and six shots taken and two bucks killed. Yep. So if six you- Six shots now, does that count like one deer you might've shot it three times or did you miss four uh, times and get two? It looks like shots taken. So I had one. Oh yeah. Deer sightings. So there are shots taken. I shot twice and got- Got one there and I shot, I had a misfire and a mess on another one. <laughs> and so, yeah, there was, there was some misses and yep. then some connections. So 201 miles, 29 days, two bucks. Go ahead the following year. Last year, I wrecked my truck. I hit a deer. The oh, very no. beginning of the season. Yeah. I didn't have my truck all season. So my days were down a little, yep. 25 days of hunting. And again, those include like Friday afternoons when I'm just headed up yeah. north or something. I had. In, in less days, so 145 miles, so over 50 miles less. Yep. This is just rifle se- rifle muzzleloader. 22 deer contacts, and I killed two deer. So I was traveling a mile less per day. I hunted five fewer days. Yep. And my average, you know, or excuse me, my deer contacts was down, but I killed the same number of deer. So you need two more columns. You need calories burned. And you need uh, <laughs> how many calories the venison produced. <laughs> That'd be it, won't, cool. it won't be good. Or dollars spent. That's the don't one. do that. Don't, one. Ever don't, do don't ever do that. Ever that do that game with your, with your wife is never fun. So what um, do you use for a watch as far as uh, being able to, to do your miles? So and... this is a Sunto. Um, okay. I track those, all those tracks come from Onyx. Okay. So I'll, I'll hit the track when I go in the woods. Okay. And then um, when I get out, I mean, it's, you know, it's a little bit time consuming, but I have a little notepad. Mm-hmm. And I write down those, yeah. those data points there. That's really cool. And then at the end of the year, there's also columns for the other guys that I hunt with yep. and they've never given me data. So <laughs> I'm working, I'm working on them still because it would be neat to compare. Yeah. I'm sure that there's similarities. And I think that one thing I've noticed over the years, um, before I was keeping this data, my mileages in a day were potentially further. Yeah. Um, and I think that one, you get a little bit better yeah. uh, and more efficient. Uh, but I also recognize that if you're putting yourself in areas where, where there truly is deer and you're not yeah. just walking for the sake of walking, yep. I do think that a lot of guys will do that too. It's like, well, I put 13 miles on today. Well, if I could put two miles on in deer woods and you put 13 miles on and yeah. you weren't really in deer woods. Nope. You know, nope. so like, again, that's where experience comes in yeah. and can be super helpful. Um, I do feel that, you know, there's a direct correlation between time spent in the woods and harvesting. Success. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. You just yeah. got to be in the woods and you do have to put miles on Big time. to Big do time. it this way. I want to hear about that Vermont 200 pounder, but I got a question for you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so when, when you're actually in hunting season, yeah. uh, what do you do as far as uh, your fitness regimen? 
yeah. w- during the season because I know a lot of guys just drop everything and they hunt. In a lot of ways, you can get out of shape doing that. It's so. So, what do you do to totally to- true, Greg? That's yeah. such a great question. Um, so, uh, in season, so we've got these like as we prepare for the season, mm-hmm. we want to like ramp up slowly over time. I think that's where some programs out there will just totally crush people yeah uh, i actually did a, a video that i'll post later um on my hike today before we met mm-hmm. um about that today's active recovery so i'm just like yep kind of taking it easy today yep uh but a lot of programs people feel like they have to be crushed to be making progress that's not the case mm-hmm. finding the minimal effective dose over long periods of time is going to be the most effective way to prepare yourself and the most sustainable it's not overwhelming it's not going to hurt you uh, and we're in this for the long haul. I mean, let's get this, you know, first and foremost, I want to live a long time Yeah. because I, I want to do this and I want to be a better father, et cetera, for a long period of time. And my health is something I can control. Yep. So to your question in season, volume and intensity drops. This is now my training. Yep. If I'm, if I hunted that many days, uh, and I went that many miles, that is what I'm preparing for. So We also, you know, you don't want to overdo it, but you also need to understand that the residual on your training doesn't last forever. Yeah. Strength, for example, that's one of the buckets that you probably want to keep full. You're filling the aerobic side of things. Yeah. You're walking every day. Well, that's one thing I was going to say with the strength thing. Adam always, he, he bulks up before the season and then after, I mean, he might lose 15 to 20 pounds and that kid hasn't got an ounce of body fat on him. Yeah. I mean. So I used to go about it that way where I was like, I knew that the attrition was going to be there and I was going to, I was definitely going to drop 10 pounds or something. So I would like want to get as strong as possible before the season. Well, that there's also a cost to that. Yep. Uh, so I now probably in the last five years, I, I really don't lift super heavy weights. Yep. Uh, I have some, that car accident left me with some back issues and you see the inversion table behind you there. And like, I'm always thinking about moving well. And I don't want there to be, I don't want my training to be too much of a cost that I'm going to have to pay for down the road. So again, minimal effective dose and knowing that there's a certain amount of strength that I've developed over the years that is a little easier for me to maintain than the novice. So like I have that going for me too, but that doesn't take long for somebody, even a novice to become, you know, their training age at six months, they can potentially have those same types of benefit from strength training, et cetera. Okay. In season mobility. And filling that strength bucket, because as you start to see diminishing strength, you lose stability at the joints, right? Like foot, ankle, knee, hip. Uh, Soon as the stability goes, you're going to lose mobility. It's a protective mechanism the body has. It just wants to keep you like, it doesn't want you to die out there, you know, so, or get hurt. So I try to keep strong and mobile. Okay. Uh, And those are really, they're short workouts. They're not super intense. They're when I have time. You can do them with a couple dumbbells, bands, and some sandbags at home or yep. your pack. Yep. Um, you don't have to have access to, you know, a fancy gym like I have, you know, at work. Uh-huh. Um, but I got to stay on them at least one time a week will help you sustain, you know, if our season's 30 days long, you know, we're talking like four to five workouts over the course of that month. Yeah. will make a big, make a big difference. Definitely. And then mobility every night. Okay. I just posted a video on our Facebook page of a tent recovery, um, basically a circuit that you can do like that's for the elk hunters or whatever guys, backcountry yeah. hunting, bivy hunting, and they're living out of a tent. It's like, well, how the hell do I do all this stuff in this tiny little space? Like I get it. I've yeah. been there. Oh yeah. Uh, and this, this will totally help you. But for the guy that's living out of a tent, you know, I mean, Christ, we hunted out of a wall tent for 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we'd cots and such, or if you're out of a little tent or you're at camp, just get these things in to help those hips, feet, the ankles, the the back, yeah. um, the things that are going to take me out of the game. Those are the ones I yeah. want to focus on. And I'm no I'm no expert on the subject, but just from the working out with Adam and doing the le- uh, weightlifting and doing the the cardio, and then starting with your program. Uh, once you start in and you build a routine, if you don't do it, it, it does something to your psyche too. So, so be able to do a little bit during the season will help you mentally too, as far Certainly. as, because uh, I know if we skip any days and you know, you just feel like a total piece of crap and yeah. it's like, even if you're out hunting, you're still, it's in the back of your mind. You that's know? accountability, man. So, like you're taking ownership for your health and that's yep. like a good, that's a good thing. Oh yeah, you know? for sure. Um, yeah. For sure. 
So uh, I need to I need to yeah. hear the story about this. That's this two hundred pound Vermont. That's a club. cool track and because story. not not a lot of guys have hit that two hundred pound mark in Vermont. My dad has. I've uh, I don't know many people that have really though. So yeah. that's a, that's, a, that's a hell of an accomplishment. Yeah, that there's that one, and then this was a Vermont uh, two hundred five. Like two of them, huh? Yeah. Holy cow! Yeah, I've been fortunate there. <laughs> um, so that that buck, um, yeah, I how that day start off. Um, my brother and I left. We're leaving Vermont to head up north. Yep. And rather than drive all the way way up there, and you know, and then hunt half a day, we said, "Well, there's good snow here. Let's yep. hunt here." So we, we headed out into some of our, our haunts and he got on a buck pretty early. I, I drove the roads and hiked in, did some hunts, you know, yep. hike up, try to cut a track, came back out. It was about eight thirty. Yep. And at that point I start to get pretty like, I got to get in the woods. This is a killing day. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you, so you just, you, again, you go in like, I'm, maybe I find a deer in here and, uh, maybe I'll find does or whatever. So. I hiked up in, I hadn't gone maybe a half mile. I found a eh, small track that wasn't super old, but wasn't super fresh. But so I'm going to follow him because who knows what he's going to take me to. Yeah. Well, he took me to the biggest mess of deer tracks, fresh deer tracks, like from the night before. Yep. And I knew I could, I found this big buck track in there and I found where he made some rubs and he was chasing does. And I mean, chaos. Yep. I spent my track, it, it's like, you can't even see in between the tracks on my Onyx at oh, the yeah. end of the day. I'm just like, <laughs> like a hound dog making yeah. checks, you know, on rabbits. And anyway, I finally sorted him out and got him headed out and he headed out and went into another mess. And I said, I'm not doing that. I can't do this all day. Yep. I'm going to make a big circle. Yep. I made that circle and I guessed right. I came on to him with a doe and they weren't moving too fast, just tinkering around, you know, eating and bet they bedded once and they got up and I, I knew that I was within, you know, four or five hours of them. And I, it didn't seem like she was running from him too bad. I think mm -hmm. he was just tending. And mm -hmm. So I moved along and they caught me. Uh, they were in a better spot. They caught me and off they went. Um, I gave them a little bit of time, but I, I just, I had a feeling like you need to move on this deer. I gave him about 10 minutes. Okay. And I said, I, he is so distracted with that doe. Uh, I could just tell by the way they took off. It was as if he didn't really, wasn't concerned with me. He was concerned with her. Yep. And in that type of situation, I might change how long I wait. Oh yeah. You know, I can't say I do it every time, but it's all situational. So I took off and I moved right along and I got, I mean, maybe gone a half mile um, and they'd stood, saw me coming or winded me or something, or she got nervous and off they go again. So I'm trucking along and you know, the game, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, here we go. But it was maybe noontime, yeah. you know, and I had, I had some time left. Well, I caught him. We, I was coming down this grown up old swale and he was standing kind of on the edge of an opening. All I could see was the hind end of a deer. Yep. So I stopped, pulled up. And I could tell the way that he was situated, he was looking at me. I just couldn't see the head. Okay. And he had probably saw him, seen me walk into that, you know, yeah. setting there. Yeah. So I held and when he, he wasn't a step, it was a turn and go. And when he, as soon as he turned, you know, I, I just saw the rack and boom. And then he disappeared. And I, oh boy. So I get over there and I, I had spined him. Oh, okay. So I dropped okay. him right there. Yep. And finished him off. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Did what you know right away it was too deer? Much? Oh, he was thick. Yeah. He was so, I mean, just short, but real thick body and oh, neck. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so that, that was pretty cool. That's um, awesome. And to be a Vermont deer, that I had already shot a 200 pounder in Vermont, but just such an amazing oh, animal. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Wow. And then, like you said, there isn't a ton of those running around anymore. It really Vermont, isn't. So, and you were, no. you was an Onyx. So that's in the recent past. Yeah. Yeah. So. That was 2019 19. or something. Okay. Um, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this, this Vermont deer, now that was quite a story. So I'd been, I'd been in, um, uh, up North and I'd shot, I'd shot one 200 and 203, this six pointer here. Okay. 
And wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that was dry ground. Um, that's a funny story. Yeah. Um, that's a grunt story. Okay. Um, you want me to start you there? Just, you just, yeah, start there, man. <laughs> <laughs> this is a funny one. So we first day of hunting and in that region, and we're all doing our dry ground plan, you know, and yep. I mean, it's crunchier, the cornflakes. Oh, yeah. So we, I go up over a hill and it's, I was even grunting like a moose that day. I mean, it was so loud, yep. you know, and the boys were giving me a hard time. Said I sounded like a frog, my, <laughs> my, my moose grunt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, it was about noontime and I came down, I hit a road and I was, I had, it was quite a walk back to my truck. Yep. And I said to the guys, I said, well, we got a, uh, my buddy Skip's got a camera down on this, you know, down on this old pond. Yep. Well, I'm going to hike down in there and pull his camera. He was coming the next day. So they just cut a new road where they were going to log in there and which kind of bothered me because we really love that area, yeah. but it was like, oh, well, better get the camera. So I get down in there and told them where I was and I get, I just pitch off the, where they were going to put a landing and I heard something, you know, crunchy, you can hear a long ways. I said, man, that sounded like a deer or some animal. So I'm grunting yep. and I kind of skipped my way down while well, I left my radio on in my pocket. And then the boys hit the truck where they were oh. and it was like, bah, 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 bah. I'm like, Jesus boy, I think I got a deer in here. You know, I'm going to turn the radio off. So if you try to get me, all right, you know, so I turn it off and I start grunting and I work my way down in and I get down to this kind of swaley, aldery section. Yep. And I just was reaching to grab my grunt call again. And I turn to my left and there's that deer standing there, staring me down. And he had come into that. Like we saw each other at the same yeah, time. same exact time. And I just pulled up, wham, dropped him right there. Yep. Well, my brother had figured out where I was, but I, of course I wasn't on the radio. So he came down and <laughs> he had just shut his door to his truck and he hears pow. <laughs> and he goes, oh, did you get us some, some hors d'oeuvres down there? Yeah. You know, I wasn't yep. far from, from the landing. <laughs> and I said, no, I just shot a big buck. He said, well, get that camera and get up here because we got other places. To go. I'm like, no, I just shot a big buck. Yeah. And he goes, no way. <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> so we joke that that was Skip's buck because oh, yeah. I was down getting his camera and shot that buck. Oh, yeah. And the, for those of you wondering, this is a really big, heavy horn six-pointer. Really nice, unique rack, too. Yeah, he must have uh, got injured or something. Yeah, he's got he's got one side a little different than the other, but really good character. Yeah, yeah, neat, so. neat deer. So I I left, I went home to back to Vermont. Yep. And it was Thanksgiving week. Yep. Yeah, Thanksgiving week, and I hunted Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday, and eat Monday, Tuesday. I had found a, a nice buck who was in an area with some does, and. I tracked him both days and it was just chaos. It was like running circles and yep. he's chasing deer. And I never felt like I was right on him, but it was just like, I was just spinning circles all day long. Yep. So Wednesday I wake up and it's pouring rain. I mean, downpour. I didn't have a peep gun at the time Yep. and didn't even have scope covers. I'd left them somewhere up in Maine. So I didn't have that. Okay. And I was sat laid there in bed. I could hear the rain on the on the roof. I was like, do I do this today? Or do I, <laughs> I just lay here? No, nope, you're going to go. So I got up and went, well, I, I cut that deer's track crossing this old skid road. And he went right into this area and I had marked it on my GPS as hub. Okay. This was before I had Onyx. Uh, and I marked as hub, like a, a buck hub. And yep. I just did the area that I kept coming back to in all those, those travels. Yep. And I said, am I going to do this again today? And I, made the decision to go in from a different angle yep. and not track him. I went right for that hub and it was pouring. Uh, I had those blue shop rags <laughs> shoved in my scope. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was, there was yeah. no other way I was going to shoot that gun unless I could keep it dry somehow. Yeah. The pockets were soaked, you know, like, oh yeah. So I'm working my way in there, sneaking along and, you know, I, I don't know, I've maybe been at it mile and a half, two miles. And I was just getting into that area and here comes this buck and we crested a rise at the same time. There was a lot of boulders in that area, a lot of like glacial kind of yep. boulders. And just as I pulled up, he, um, I had that blue rag in the scope. Oh, oh my God. shit. So I just hold there. Please don't see me. Cause I'm not going to have, I'm not gonna be able to pull those out and yeah. shoot you. So he didn't. And he moved behind that boulder. Oh, wow. 
And I quick, quick pulled him out. And then he came out the other side and I let him have it. Wow. And put him down there. Um, and that, uh, that was the end <laughs> of that. Which is surprising so, blue is like something a deer sees really bad. So. Oh, it, yeah, yeah, oh, right, yeah, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So I, so. yeah, I, I was fortunate there and that was two, 200 pounders. Holy that, cow. That what year. a, what a, what a stretch huh. of a couple of weeks there, huh? Yeah. And then Jesus. I know that was a, there was a period there where <laughs> I had, I had like four of them in, in yeah. a stretch of a three year span. And then I blame it on elk hunting. I started getting all, I'm putting all my time into going yeah. out West and I stopped shooting the, you know, the, yeah. I don't think. Isn't that's... the fun part about elk hunting though? Like the gear and like the planning <laughs> and the, I, I mean, I, I haven't even done it yet. And I've like got a list oh going God. and like, it's just, it's, it's so much fun, the prep work and what do I use for this and what I use for that and tenting and, and hiking sticks and you know, you name it, you know, there's it's a lot so of much gear. fun, you know? Yeah. But, there's a reason why these companies are making so much money. Oh, big on time. It. Big time. Um, so, but yeah. But uh, well, it wouldn't be a Greg podcast unless I hit you a little little comedy here. Oh so boy, here I got go. a uh, All right. I got a couple of really well respected uh, fitness icons, and oh. I, they have some advice here, and I want you to give your input on this and tell okay. me if this is so. For the great Ronnie Coleman, multi <laughs> <laughs> multi time Mister Universe, this is his uh, this is his opinion on leg workouts. He says uh, <laughs> you either push or pull a door. No such thing as leg a door. So stop training legs. Would you agree with him? <laughs> no, I disagree. I disagree. You got the legs are probably the most important. Big part. time. Yeah. Big time. They're yeah. your foundation. There's gonna, those are what are going to get you from point A to point B yeah. to put those long seasons in. They're going to get sore and tired, but you better freaking prepare them for it. Yeah. The legs are the most important. That's probably one of the biggest differences in the Big Woods program. Yeah. From the West, more of the Western uh, hunting program that we have is that. Out west, you're gonna lug a pack every day. Yep. You know, because you're you're packing those animals out. Oh yeah. Um, it's not a heavy pack. It'll be heavy when you pack in. Um, and you might, you know, you might be like thirty pounds maybe with whatever gear you decide to take each day. Yep. Um, but that wears on you. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're it is different. The terrain is different. Your footwear is different. Uh, you're wearing nice lightweight clothing. I, mean, I don't wear wool out there other than my base layers i'm yep. wearing the techie more you know mostly kuyu gear yep. first light yep you can't really wear that stuff tracking deer you know no. we're wearing we're wearing your coats yeah and, exactly and wool pants and trying to find the lightest but also the most effective option yep. um but your legs are most vital. important part i oh, figured yeah. you might say that but... without a doubt you better have <laughs> you better have good legs and then uh, my second one um is from the great Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh. Have you ever heard of him? No. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> he says the best activities for your health are pumping and, and humping. Would you, would you agree with that? <laughs> I totally agree. Yeah, totally agree. Oh man. Yeah, he's spot on with yeah, that. He's, yeah. a, he's an animal. Just like that. a just like an old buck, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, jeez. I just saw a Netflix documentary on him, and he's still going at it every day, working out. And yeah. He's, Hey, know how much of him of is dude. natural and how much. Is yeah, you're right. But you know, still it's just, it, 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 uh, it's pretty funny to watch him, but, uh, yeah, but yeah. I've really enjoyed this. This has been a really good mix of, uh, preparation and great hunting stories too. Um, yeah, it's just been, um, you have anything else you want to touch on before we, before we wrap it up? Cause yeah, I think, um, outside of like, we talked, we touched on this before yeah. we got on that, um, we, you know, these, these platforms, these social media platforms and podcast platforms, like we have this opportunity to influence, right? Mm -hmm. The influencers, uh, this is kind of a new frontier. Uh, and I, and I have, we have witnessed, uh, certainly a change in, uh, hunting as we know it. Yep. Uh, it's certainly brought more, um, both positive and negative. And I think that, um, I'm certainly conflicted at times with, uh, I mean, I'm, Everybody knows they can find me on social media. I have a website. We utilize um, hunting as a like a marketing strategy, so to speak. Yep. Uh, you know, for me, I'm trying to promote health and fitness uh, and preparation for backcountry, you know, activities, etc. Others might be promoting, you know, the the podcast or your gear or, or whatever. Yep. And we're utilizing these platforms. And I I just think it's important to understand that what's what's most important. Right. Like the one thing, the one component that we can't do without, and that is the resource, yeah. right? That is the animals. 
that is the land that we hunt, uh, whether it's public, public, private. Um, I mean, a lot of people don't understand that the land that we hunt, even though these big woods are so vast, it's actually private land. Yep. That's timber company land. Oh, yeah. And at any time, these private entities could decide like, hey, we're going to make it a lottery or we're going to charge. There's going to be leases. This, we're going to charge money because it, it's going to make more than timber does. Yep. Uh, I'm not trying to give them any ideas. No. But, but like that could happen for us here in the Northeast. But I think also we need to, like, we're constantly under fire as a hunting community uh, from those that want to take away what we love so much, a, a, a way of life, yep. like absolutely a way of life. Um, it is in our genes from the very beginning. And I think that we need to understand that we're not, we need to have, like, there's a certain amount of etiquette for how we post online. Are, are we using these platforms for like, self-promotion mm -hmm. and you know driven from ego uh, or are we using these to these platforms to help educate and promote like you know this traditional way of for us tracking bucks or hunting in the northeast or wherever yeah and then understand that we are one community so like not being at war with each other and knowing that what you post does have like there's always repercussion so before you post something online, you know, just think about that yeah. and what you say to others and how you portray this community, because we're all a representative of each other. Uh, so that, that part will lead to, you know, greater conservation and understanding. Yep. Uh, and I highly encourage folks to become, we just became a corporate uh, partner with uh, Backcountry Hunter and Anglers yep. for the New England chapter. Yep. God, I encourage folks to do that. Uh, it's, you know, like some of the best money you'll spend it's really not it's small potatoes well it's a good way to give back too it's they an always amazing have amazing way where they're, and it's you know. not just a good way to give back it's a good way to have a voice yeah uh and understanding that even if we're not out in africa losing rights to lion hunting or whatever it might be like yeah. well who gives a shit about that i only care about well guess what that they're starting there you know and they're it's it's we're all one yeah and so understanding that we need to support them we need to support California losing spring bear hunting and, you know, Colorado, these, these, um, legislators and, and elected officials who yep. are not in support, like we need to have a voice. And there is, there is people like the backcountry hunters and anglers, uh, Howl Org, um, Sportsman's Alliance, like yep. do something about it. Yep. You know, don't just freaking talk about how much it sucks that we're losing these rights or that there's this attack on us. Don't just you know, sit there at camp and bitch about it, freaking do something about it, yep. nope. you know, be, well a, be a true conservationist and take part. Like it, it, even if it's not just money, like education, yep. you know, and look at what's happening with education for hunter education and, and archery in schools. You know, yep. I was posting things about that last month. Uh, contact your legislators and people like howl.org and, and the BHA, um, Sportsman's Alliance, they make it easy for you to do that. Yeah. They'll pre-prepare the email to help you send. And here's the list of legislators and, and representatives who can help you have that voice. Yep. And then just understand that, you know, if, if you're unsure about what you're about to post, you know, online and the why, then maybe rethink it before you do like the, exactly. the 24 hour rule to responding to any situation. If it feels dirty, it probably is. It probably is. You know, and it's like, I always, I ask myself like, could I live like, here's a good example, or, um, could you, would you still enjoy hunting the way you do now if you couldn't keep the rack? Ooh, that's tough. Right. Yeah, like yeah, here we are yeah. talking about all these racks. Oh, and yeah. the only way I can tell you that story is cause you know, you're like, Hey, what about that one? And yeah. like, for us, we're using it in a super, like, um, very enjoyable way of reflecting, Yeah, but we could do that based on my journal entries. Oh yeah. And I sure. could help you build a picture in your mind about it too. Well, that's why Read podcasts, the book. Yeah. That's why podcasts are so good because instead of just looking at a grip and grin. Yeah. You're now, we're now explaining the whole process and the whole story. And, I agree. And I think that, I think that what you're doing is great as far as you're bringing, you're bringing hunting into kind of a new demographic as far as mixing, you know, with the athleticism and the, in the taking care of your body and, and also being able to go out and hunt and provide your own you know, meat, the table. food 
and there's nothing better. So, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I think that you're in the, in the definite, uh, good category of, of the, uh, social media and everything going on right now. So I um, hope so. I mean, that, that point, the field, the table is, yeah, I think that's something we can all hop on board with and and help, um, for sure. So, so, um, if somebody were wants to get involved in the Big Woods program right now, how do they do that? Can yeah, you, for sure. Yeah. So uh, that that team, they can find me through social media, yep. uh, Ridgeline Athlete on Instagram and same on Facebook. You can also email me at ridgelineathlete at gmail.com. Uh, uh, and you'll just inquire, want to, you know, put it in the subject line or, or just send me a message. Hey, hey, coach. Or Adrian, I, I want to be a part of the team. I'd yep. like to get started as soon as possible. Yep. Uh, and I'll get you set up. There is some basic equipment needs. Uh, a lot of people Not have. Not too bad, though. No. No, Definitely. I try to make it super accessible. Uh, if you have the decked out gym, great. If you don't, no big deal. Yep. People see my videos. A lot of my training is here in the garage, and I got a couple hundred thousand dollars of gym equipment. <laughs> you know, but like. That's it, the best thing, though, being able to do it right in the privacy of your own home. For um, sure guy like me i'm i'm a member at planet fitness up in south burlington and i'm yep. a little self-conscious about stuff but like i can do your whole program in my garage at home you know so it, it's just really really cool but you definitely um if you're one of those guys and i'm not you know i'm kind of ashamed to admit this but uh you're tracking a buck and he goes up a ridge and it's one o'clock in the afternoon and you look up there and you say oh my god I, I can't do it or or fuck it you know we'll do it tomorrow you owe it to yourself to to you know do this program or a pro you know or just start taking care of yourself a little bit better to where you know your body you you said a good thing to me um you want your body to be you know uh, a weapon a weapon not a liability absolutely so and you know greg that what you just said is so much bigger than hunting yep the the to stop at one o'clock and not climb that mountain is that you giving up on your health yeah. You know, in life, yeah. whether you're a hunter or not, like just giving up on, you know, high blood pressure and, and, or whether it's mental illness or, or anything, yeah. we can make that, that same, um, connection there. And like, if I, if I give myself, if I give myself the, the ability to persevere and to never let up, as I always say, to keep charging, like you, you will do that in life too. Like training is just the, that's just like the 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 engine so to speak mm-hmm. uh and you're going to utilize that in all aspects of your life yep. uh, and that's that's pretty important because you know we got kids uh, and there's always somebody watching you know like i, I want to be that person for them because yep. um you know at some point they're going to have to be that person for the next generation and it ain't getting any easier for in this world by way of health yep. uh, it's only getting harder for us so oh yeah yeah and it's never too late i mean it doesn't matter your age or or that we got a month till the season even if you can swing it three, four percent in your favor, that might be the difference in getting that buck or not getting that buck. Absolutely. Or, you know, so for sure. So, yeah. anyways, well, thanks for what you're doing for for everybody. We really appreciate it. And um, I'm gonna give it a hell of an effort. And uh eight weeks from now we'll check back in and see see what the hell's going on. I got on, faith but... in you, buddy. I'm gonna keep checking <laughs> in on you too. <laughs> so well, thanks for doing this. This has been awesome, probably a good place to stop. But uh, but yeah, we'll catch you on the next one. Absolutely. Thank thanks. you. Appreciate it. You're listening to Stagger Cast, brought to you by Stagger Gear.